the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. Not in the flesh. To be bringing sounds from heaven. And yet we are bringing those sounds in the gyration of demonic spirits. Father, we thank you for this weekend. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for RC and worry. We thank you for the point man that you've set over this house. Thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to gather before you. We are asking one thing from you this morning, that we would have the time of our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Please have your seats. God bless you. Um, hold on with the slides yet. Uh, I will tell you when to bring it up. I would like us to start from Songs of Solomon, chapter 5. Now, um, it's an honor to be here with you. It's a huge honor. It's not one that I take for granted at all. Um, and so, thank you for coming this morning. I think there are so many things you should have done with your Saturday. And that you are here, I mean, on a Saturday morning. If you were not here, we would not have anybody to speak to. And uh, from my experience, people are not really interested in apologetics like that. I, it's baffling to me because when my eyes opened into apologetics, I was like, where have you been all my life? And I thought that, I mean, everybody will have the same reaction, but to see this number here this morning, it's really, really um, a blessing. And I pray that the expectations in your hearts will not be cut short in the name of Jesus Christ. We are going to have a good time this weekend. I'm sure of that. Um, I, I, I am not going to offload so many things on you. There are just two things that I am expecting we should be able to do this weekend. And if you are able to do those things exhaustively, I can assure you that your faith in God, the GP will increase. See, there is something that the revelation of the word of God does to a man. And um, I know this from experience because I'm a beneficiary of that revelation. When God reveals his counsel to you, it doesn't matter what you are feeling inside of your heart. There is something that you know about God that anything that is going on inside of you cannot change what you know. Do you understand? I'll give you a good example. Muhammad Buhari is the president of Nigeria, whether you like him or not. You can wake up one morning. There are so many mornings I have woken up and felt that he should not be the president of Nigeria. But it does not change the fact that he is the president of Nigeria, irrespective of how I felt inside. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you with me? You see, there, is, there, is, there are certain things about God that are unchanging. They are unwavering. They are like the fixed star. So that even if the devil throws a thousand darts at you, there is one thing we know. We know that God is faithful. That one is not negotiable. All right? We know that God cannot lie. Are you with me? But you see, there is a journey that you'd have to make to bring your heart, and I mean your feelings now, to bring your heart to the place where your mind is. And so that is why when 1 Peter 3.15 says you should sanctify the Lord in your heart and be ready to, bring, to give an answer to anyone that asks you the reason for the hope that you have. Can you, is this thing available in, in the Amplified Bible? If you have the Amplified Bible, the Amplified version, I would like you to put it up. What that verse was saying is bringing a marriage between what is going on inside of our heart with whatsoever is going on in our minds. For many believers... Okay, now look at this. This is, this, is, this is a word that we don't like using in church, and it, we should not be proud of that. But look at what, this is the word of God. If you believe the word of God, then you should believe that this is what God says. 
But in your heart, set Christ apart as holy. Where do you do that? You do that inside your heart. Right? And acknowledge him as Lord. He now says, always be ready to give a what? To give a what? To give a logical defense. Now, I said that this is a word we don't like using in church because somehow we have evolved into a species that have been made to believe that faith is not logical. If it is logical, it is not faith. The more illogical it is, the more faithful or faith-filled it is. Well, that's not what the Bible says. But what, what I want to express to you is that the issue of logic is something that does not happen in your heart. It is something that is processed in your mind. It happens in your mind. And there are so many scriptures I could show you in that regard. But they were not joking when they say you should love the Lord your God with all your mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you, are you sure you understand what I'm saying? Do you remember, we have so many young people here, do you remember the first time you fell in love? That first time. And you thought that, wow, that this is Angel Michael in the flesh. Now, what you realized after like two weeks had passed was that you were looking for what you were loving in this thing. Have you, are you with me? After the infatuation had gone, you're looking for, why was my heart going in this direction? The reason is because um, you are trapatite. You are, you, you, you are made up of components, of compartments. So there is a part of you that responds to feeling. There is a part of you that responds to reason. You are instructed by scripture to serve the Lord with your heart, to serve the Lord with your mind. That is why one of the things they tell you to do as part of your reasonable service is that you should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What we do in church most times is the removing of our mind. But scripture says that you, your mind should be renewed, not removed. Are you with me? Now, the point is this. That there are days that you would wake up and you will not feel like God loves you. There are days that you would wake up and you will feel that God, haba, haba, haba. It's not fair now, haba. It's just that it is God. That even if you don't say it, he knows that it is in your mind. And so for me, I'm like, whether I say it or not, God knows this is what I am thinking. So let me just say it at once. Right? There are days that you would wake up and you will not feel like you want to be a Christian that day. I tell you the truth. The thing that will keep you in that day is no more what is in your heart. Because there is nothing there anymore. And if you do not understand what I'm saying yet, you will get to the point in your Christian work where you will understand what I'm saying by experience. By experience, right? In that day, it is the thing that your mind has made contact with. That you know that no matter what, I have known, I have known too much about God. To deny that God is real. And there are many times God does things like that. And that's one of the reasons why we pray for encounters many times. One of the things that happens in encounters is that it creates for you a reality that nothing that happens inside of you can shake. Do you understand what I'm saying? You people, if we start like this, we will not finish today. So, this thing, get back at me. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. So now, now, it is important that in your fellowship, and that is exactly why we need to read the word. It is, the word of God is God's letter to us. God took it seriously to write letters to us, to write words to us, so that we fellowship with his mind through his words. If you read what I write, you can have an idea of how I think. Right? And so sometimes I can know I can know if somebody is worth responding to by how the, person's uh, how the person writes. Because I do a lot of engagements online. And if I, I, can, I can know if someone is worth my time by how the person writes. In the same way, we can access your mind by the way you express yourself. Right? The, the word of God is the gateway to the mind of God. Right? God 
God revealed his mind to us by his word. And this, this is a deeply theological concept. However, the point is this, that as you, as you fellowship with the word of God, your mind is being renewed to begin to think like God. Because the idea is that you fellowship with God's word so that you conform your life to the thing you are fellowshipping with. And if, you, if that thing is successful, one of the things we will find out about you is that you will begin to think like God. And when you begin to think like God, you will begin to act the way you think. It is only somebody that has a bipolar disorder that thinks differently from the way he acts. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there is a day that will come that your heart will not feel like you love God. But there is something your mind has made contact with. That You tell your heart that, like there are days when you wake up in the morning and you don't feel like going to work or going to school. <laughs> but your body will tell your mind, to your heart, and even though you don't feel like it, today we need to go there. Let's just drag ourselves there. There are days like that, where you do not feel like praying, you do not feel like God loves you. But on those days, you can trust God in the dark because you are not in the dark about God. And so this is one of the reasons why we do Christian apologetics. And Christian apologetics is a, it's just one of the things we do. But the idea is, whether you call it apologetics or you call it your normal Christian life, because there are people that say things like, for example, Christianity is a way of life. Christianity is not a religion. It's a way of life. I don't have any problem with however you want to define it. What I am saying is this. Call it anything. As long as your action, as long as... As long as the way you live is accurate, you can give it any tag that you want. But the point is that this is a deeply biblical injunction. And apart from being able to represent, there are times, there are times when the people you need to give answer to is your heart. It's not the atheist outside, though. It's not the agnostic outside. There are days when life will look you in the eye. And you will, if you have not come there yet, I'm saying that you will come there in the future where you will really doubt if God does exist. You yourself, as you speak in tongues like this, you believe that you are deep. A day will come when you would... Uh, I, am I sure I'm not getting this thing wrong? In that day, you are the one that will need the answers. And it will be a bad day if on those days you don't have the answers. You know why? Because you are going to look for answers. The way God created us, eh? he created us with a void. It was, it was Augustine that said that our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. So there is always going to be the opportunity you will need, you, you will seek to find out how to fill the void that is being created in your heart. And I've seen many people like that, you know, along the way. But... For you to be a proper witness to others, you would first have to be an adequate witness for yourself. Are you understanding what I'm saying? All right, so I, I want to focus on two things this, this weekend. The first thing I want to focus on is the scriptures. The second thing I want to focus on is the person of Jesus. Those are the two things I want to focus on um, for this apologetics weekend. And then, maybe in the future, it will... Um, then I will give you time to ask questions and answer, and, and then answer your questions. Um, and let's see how far the Lord will take us in that road. So let's go to Songs of Solomon, chapter 5. Songs of Solomon, chapter 5. Um, I will be very happy if the screen... All right can help me do that. This is so much. No, King James, please. Take us back to King James. Yeah. So, appointed to be read in churches. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. The book of Songs of Solomon is um, a poetic discourse. And in that book, you'll see things like my spouse. You'll see things like my sister. You'll see things like my love. You see things like beloved, right? You see things like my brother. Now, so there were there were different characters in that drama. It's a, it's a wonderful drama. When you see my sister, it is the man, the male figure that is talking. Hmm? 
When you see my love, it is the male figure that is talking to the woman, addressing the female figure, calling her my love. My beloved, it is the female figure addressing the man, calling him my beloved. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because this is going to help us as we go on. I am coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. Hmm. Give me the last verse before this verse 1. That's chapter 4. That's chapter 4 before this verse 1. So it gives you an understanding of what he says I've come into my garden. It says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon whose garden? Upon my garden. All right? Give me verse 15. Give me verse 15. Mm, verse 14. 13, 12, good, verse 12, a garden enclosed is who? A garden enclosed is my sister. So according to this, because I didn't intend to go this far, but if we need to understand what is going on, we need to go this far, all right? A garden enclosed is my sister. So according to this passage, who is the garden? The sister is the garden, according to this passage. A garden enclosed is my sister. Great. So don't forget that the sister is the garden. Let's go to verse 14. Verse 14. So the sister is the garden. Okay, 15 now. Give me 15. Now, verse 15. A fountain of gardens, it says. First she is a garden. <laughs> then she is a fountain of gardens. A well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. Verse 16. Awake, O not win. There is a long discourse that comes that ends at this prayer. Awake, O not win. I don't have time for it this, this morning. Maybe tomorrow evening, if the river leads us here, we may touch it a bit because it's a very important prayer for you to pray. This prayer is awake, O not win, and come down south, blow upon my garden that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved. So who is the beloved now? The man, right? So who is praying this prayer? It's the, the lady, the sister, that is, the bride that is praying this prayer. He says, awake, O not wind, and come down south, blow upon my garden. Remember that she is the garden. A garden enclosed is my sister. It is important here because this garden is enclosed. That means there were so many things in this garden, but there was no access into this garden. And the prayer she is praying is so that access can be granted into the garden. Do you understand what I'm saying? There was a garden, though. There is a garden. This garden has gardens inside of it. But there are other things that are inside this garden. There is someone that wants to access this garden but cannot access this garden. And so there is this prayer. Awake, O North Wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden so that the spices may flow out. Let my beloved come in. It is when the spices flow out that my beloved will come in. It is when the spices flow out that my beloved will come in. This is a deep thing. There's something happening there. But let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. So the garden is the sister. The garden belongs to the sister because she says, she says, blow upon my garden. She is the garden. The garden belongs to her. But at the same time, in the very same sense, the garden belongs to her beloved. You are not yet getting the gist. Don't worry, you'll get it in the future. Like Apostle Laura used to say, the secret things belong unto God. All right? But here, let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. So the prayer at this point, this is like the lady at this point was wishing, was praying that the north wind should, should blow into her garden so that something can come out and someone can come in. And this person that is coming in is coming into his garden and eats his pleasant fruit. Now, give me verse 1 of chapter 5. Give me verse 1 of chapter 5. Now, this is the beloved speaking. He says, I am come into my garden. Whatever prayer this lady prayed in verse 16, the prayer has been answered. Because by, chapter, uh, by verse 1 of chapter 5, the beloved is the one speaking here. And he is saying that, I am come 
I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse, I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. So in this same verse, the, the man is speaking, the woman is speaking. Give me verse 2. This is the woman speaking. She says, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved. I can't do this this morning. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, open to me, my sister, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of night. Verse 3, verse 3, so that I don't get distracted. Now, this is the woman speaking. She says, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? Excuse me, ma, were you not the one praying just a few verses earlier that the wind should blow in so that the spices can come out? And the man can come in. Now the man has come in and he is requesting responsibility from you. And you are saying, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? Is this woman saying she doesn't know how to dress up? And many of us are like this woman. That, Lord, encounter me. Lord, baptize me. When he finally shows up and he begins to request responsibilities, you're like, ah, uh -uh. now only me kill Jesus. Why, why, am I, why am I the one to do all of these things? You see, because when he comes, he will seek, he, will, he wants your commitment on the table. You are the one that invited him to come, right? Normally, you prayed that the wind should blow. And that is why there are so many prayers. And when I was in the university or when I was on campus, you know, we read books like God's Generals. And our heads scattered. Say, so, ah, what are we doing with our life? See what people did in their generation. And then we prayed prayers that implicated us. Yes, I mean, you pray those kinds of prayers. I pray that, see, well, see, eh? there are certain things that God will do. He will just lead you by hand like that and put you in a place. What you did not see was that somebody was leading you there. You thought you went by yourself. And then you now prayed and said, give me Nigeria. Yeah. So it is the same prayer. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden. It's the same prayer, right? When we come to meetings like this, and we start praying prayers like, uh, Oh, fire, Holy Ghost, fire, burn everywhere. <laughs> they are looking at you, and the day they respond to that prayer, eh? you think it is a normal, you know, when fire comes, I fall on the ground. No, that's not how it works. So they will ask you, Give me verse 2. Go back to verse 2. Look at what he said. He says, open to me. Open to me. I thought you said in verse 1, I have come into my garden. Why are you saying open to me? Again, I don't have the time for that. But there are layers to commitments. You see this thing, eh? God can be in your vicinity. God can be in your neighborhood, but it's not in your premises. God can be in your neighborhood, but it's not in your apartment. There are certain levels of commitment that you and I would have to put in the table as capital that God can do business with. And many of you know these things on a very, very personal level. That he will tell you, you do this. And you say, ah, if I fast this long, won't I die? That's exactly what is going on here. So she says in verse 3 that I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Verse 4. Verse 4. My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels, they were moved. My bowels were moved for him. Verse 5. Verse 5. I rose up to open to my beloved, but this time it was too late. And my hands dropped with me, and my fingers with sweet-smelling me, upon the handles of the lock. Upon the handles of the lock. Go on. Go on. Verse 6. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself, and was gone my soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. May this not be our testimony, you. May this not be our testimony. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him. No, no, no. Go back. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Verse 7. Verse 7. The watchmen that went around the city found me. Very interestingly, this woman was looking for somebody, and some other people found her. She was seeking someone else, and some other people found her. 
This is not the case of Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus in Luke 19? That in Luke 19, Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus. And it was Jesus that found, at the end of the day, it was Jesus that found him. You remember that story now? That he, was look, he, went around, he went ahead to look for Jesus, and he could not because of the press and because he was little of stature. And then he found himself to, at, uh, upon a sycamore tree, and then Jesus finally found him. Um, in the case of Diana, remember Diana? Remember Diana in Genesis 31? Is it 31? No, I think 34. In the case of Diana, Diana went to see other people and Shechem, the son of Hamor, saw her. She went to find other people and she was found by another. You see, in this case, this woman went to seek the one that first came to seek her, but she was found by the watchmen. There are so many stories around this, this case. But she says, they smote me. This is what happened when they found her. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took away my veil from me. They took away my veil from me. You remember that in verse 1, when the bridegroom was, calling, was ad addressing her, he addressed her as my own defiled. You remember? She said in verse 7 that they took away my veil from me. Verse 8, go on, let's go on. Now, she says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. Verse 9. Verse 9. I'm going through a lot of treasures because I want to get to my point. Now look at this question. This is a, this is a very important question. She, remember in verse 8, she told the daughters of Jerusalem that I charge you, if you find my beloved, tell him that I am sick of love. Now sometimes when you want to reach somebody, that your heart is with. And for some reasons, you can't reach the person. A thousand things begin to pass through your mind, including the incredible. Like, did they have an accident? Are they dead? What's the problem? B the reason is because that's where your heart is. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? That's where your heart is. She now said, she said, I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem, if you see my love, if you see my beloved, tell him that I am sick. I am sick of love. So, it, because of the state that these women found her, these daughters found her, because of the state they found her, they now asked her a question. What is thy beloved? What is thy beloved? More than another beloved, O thou fairest among women. What is thy beloved? More than another beloved, that thou dost so charge us. The problem, the thing that made them ask her is because of the way she was asking them. They say, what is thy beloved? More than other beloved. Because there are many beloved. People have, people, are, you the, are you the first in a relationship? Are you the first person to worship another? What is your beloved? More than other beloved. That you are carrying this matter on your head. That's basically the question they were asking here. So, in First Peter 3 verse 16, they say that the reason people, they said you should sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. And be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you the reason for the hope that you have. Because they will see the hope that you have. And they want to find out, why do you have this kind of hope? Right? It is because of the way she asked. That they asked her, what is your beloved? People have been in relationship before. People... They, People have been in a relationship before. But why are you asking us? Why are you charging us like this? What is your beloved more than other beloved that thou so charge us? The first point I want to make here is that, you see, your, the way you live your life is your first platform for evangelism. The way you live your life, because it's basically evangelism. That's basically what it is. And I'm speaking in, within the context of apologetics, you... You give people the opportunity to want to listen to what you have to say. If your life has already given them a reason to ask questions, be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you the reason for the hope that you have. So they will see a hope first before they will ask you why you have the hope. Are you with me? Uh -huh. You know, in First Thessalonians, Paul was talking to the Thessalonian brethren. I said, I heard that some people died amongst you people. But please, let us be careful not to mourn like them that have no hope. That means there is a way to mourn as somebody that has hope. 
There is a way to mourn as somebody that does not have hope. And there are so many examples that, that um, I can give in this regard. You know that, you know that there is how, <laughs> there is how somebody will make a threat. And one, now this threat is made to two different kinds of people. And one person genuinely, genuinely is frightened by this threat. The other person is not disturbed. And this is on a normal day a threat that should make someone terrified. But the difference between the two people is that there is something that this person that is not terrified knows or has that knows that this threat cannot be carried out. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Okay? When I, in my first year in the university, when we were, because I started off with, um, they call it, they called it pre-degree then. And they used to tell us that, you see, in pre-degree, your name is written in pencil. And the implication of your name being written in pencil is that if you do not pass, you will, you will go back to your village. That's basically what it is. So people want to read and die on top of the book. You will see all kinds of things happening during you know, pre-exam period. You know, you go for what we call night classes then, reading and all sorts. And then, in the midst of all of that heavy preparation, somebody comes to night class and is playing game. Eh? Comes to night class and is playing game. It's not as if he's reading small and playing game small, so I can remember what he's reading. He's not just serious at all. And we had somebody like that back then. And we're like, what is? Because there are people that they read, though, but they know that it's not by reading, that you need help because you can read this way and the exam comes from this way. That is a very valid possibility. It has happened to us many times. In fact, one terrible situation that we had was that during ex um, the week before exam, the lecturers did not complete their correct, um, what do you call that thing now? Uh -huh. Course outline, yeah. They didn't complete their course outline for whatever reason. There was no strike, nothing, but they didn't complete it. So he went to the exam, one zealous lecturer now showed up and said, this is AOC, you know AOC? Area of concentration. So every exam that we, for this course, the exam is going to come from, and he gave us like 10 points to read from. So everybody <laughs> read those 10. He now traveled, so he didn't set the exam. He wasn't the one that set the exam. This is, it happened to me in, in, my, in my generation. So we went to the exam hall, and um, after we had crammed all we needed to cram, I was sitting at the, you know, it was an amphitheater, so it goes like this. They started sharing the question papers from the front. The first thing we heard was Jesus. <laughs> ha. And this Jesus is not from a religious person. It's not like this is how he talks. So we heard Jesus. Then before the exam, the question paper reached me, somebody had already left the exam hall. He left. There's no need writing this, this exam. <laughs> when the question paper got to me, I understood why there was a cause for intercession at the time. Right? So I just bent my head down and said, Lord, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. <laughs> that was the honest prayer I prayed from my heart. That that will not leave my soul in hell. He will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Yeah. And God didn't. Uh, no, God did not. So this is the point that there is how somebody who does not have any way of getting across will approach that exam. That somebody who knows that even if I don't write anything here, I will still pass this exam because I have a way to go around it. One of them has hope, the other does not. Hmm? So the way the person that does not have hope will respond, it is the, that, that Jesus. The other guy that walked out of the exam hall, he passed the exam without writing the exam. <laughs> so you see, one had hope, the other did not. Paul said that, uh, sorry, I come from Nigeria, all right? So these are the kind of things that happen in the country where I come from. <laughs> so Paul said, when someone, dies, when someone dies amongst you, there is how to mourn. And you should not mourn like them that have no hope. Why? Because there is... There is the resurrection. 
And we know that if someone is lost to us today, the person is not lost to us eternally. As long as he slept in the Lord, we will see them again. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's one of the reasons why you cannot be legitimately beefing your brother in Christ. You, you, are, you are stuck with him. How can you be beefing your brother? You are stuck with him. If you don't like his face now, you, you are going to deal with that face for eternity. Do you understand what I'm saying? Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so this is a very serious thing because I can understand how somebody will see severe relationship from an unbeliever, but you are beefing your brother. How will you do it over there? You, you'll be seen, you'll be in your face every time. Right? So Paul said, we are, we are not lost these people. They are going to be with us. So there is how to mourn like them that have no hope. Then, then, this is what Peter was talking about. That when people see your life, when they see the way you conduct yourself, that they are supposed to respond somehow to something, and you don't respond in that way, they will ask you, why are you this hopeful? He says, always be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you the reason for the hope that you have. So it is the life that you lived that provoked the questions that they asked. Are you with me? It was the way she charged the daughters of Jerusalem in this verse that provoked the question that they asked her. So they asked her, what is thy beloved? What is thy beloved? It is our life that will provoke questions. It is our living that will provoke questions. It is, our, it is our, our presentation that will provoke questions. I know the thing about question is that if somebody asks you a question and you are answering them, eh, they cannot accuse you of preaching at them. I was on my own. You came and asked me a question. Say, I'm giving you the answer to the question that you asked. If you did not ask me a question, I wouldn't have preached to you. I was on my own. You carried your leg and met me and asked me a question. This is how to do evangelism. That you live your life in such a way, and of course, you live your life in such a way that it will provoke questions in the hearts of all them that watch you or all them that observe your conduct. So, what is thy beloved? More than another beloved that thou dost so charge us. Verse 10. Quickly, let's run. Now she began to talk. This is apologetics now that she's doing. She begins to talk. She says, my beloved is white and ruddy. The chiefest among 10,000, verse 11. His head, begins to describe his head. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven, verse 12. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set, verse 13. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. Verse 14, his hands are as gold rings set with beryl. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. Verse 15, his legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. Verse 16. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. And this is my friend. O daughters of Jerusalem. What an expose. What is the response they gave her? Verse 1. The next verse. The next verse. Whither is thy beloved gone? O thou fairest among women, whither is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek him with thee? <laughs> See, eh? this woman sponsored, sponsored a search for her beloved by a description. After she described her beloved, the people that heard that say, Men and brethren, what do we do? This is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 3. Are you with me? After, after she described her, Acts chapter 2 rather, after she described her beloved, the women said, hey, we want to follow you and seek him. Whither is thy beloved gone? Let me let you know that people will respond to evidence. 
people will respond to evidence when the evidence matches your life. Because your life provokes questions. Oh, and in the day when your life provoked questions, they asked you questions and you had answers for them. The feedback was, whither is thy beloved gone? There are two things I want to show you in this verse before I go on with you. And it is very important because you can run on the speed lane and you crash land. If you do not take note of these two things, there are two things here in this verse. The first is this, that this woman's life, this woman's life, it, it provoked her life, her, her living, provoked questions from the people that she was charging, right? And when they asked her, she was able to describe in detail of the one who is her beloved so much so that, that she, could, she could provoke followership from these people. Yet, this, this woman was divorced from her husband. Are you with me? Are you understanding what I'm saying? If you hear this description, you would think she was just coming from the bedchamber. How do you know him this much? She knew him so well, but she had never met him. Because in, verse, in chapter 4, she prayed that he will come. In chapter 5, he came. But he did not enter because she didn't let him. Yet, when she was asked questions, she had what to say to the detail. This is one of the bane of apologetics. Is that you can separate your heart from your mind so much so that your mind is full and your heart is hollow. And so 1 Peter 3.16 says, Sanctify Christ in your heart and be ready where? In your mind. It is, it is supposed to be a synergy between your heart and your mind. So I said there were two things in that place. The first is that, is that the woman had what it took. He had what it took in her mind to describe the one she was seeking. She knew who she was seeking so that she could find him when she found him. And that's exactly a very important point for us to note because there are many people that are seeking God but do not know which God. Yes, now, they are seeking God. But when they, they, they shrine in the gates of your city, when, you know that, that place? When they reach there, they will say that this is the house of God. When they go to Mecca, they will say, ah, this is the house of God. They are genuinely seeking God, but they know not which God they seek. You see, the implication is that you are going to crash land sooner than later. God made the heart. God made the mind. God did not intend that any should function in isolation of the other. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The problem that many people, and of course, I have seen it even amongst the apologetics circle, that many people who do Christian apologetics, they do Christian apologetics alone, without devotion. Eh? So they have descriptions to make about the one that they follow, or the one that they seek to follow. Yet they have no relationship with him. Do you know the arguments for the, for the existence of God? Do you know the Kalam cosmological? In fact, in reality, there are many there are many people at a very professional level who are Christian apologists. Christian apologists. That means they do Christian apologetics and they are Christians. And they do not believe many of the things that you believe. Example, like that God can heal the sick today. They don't believe it. That those acts, they ended with the first apostles. That prophecy can still come out today. They don't believe it. That those acts, they ended with the first apostles. Even though that is a contradiction in principle. But this is the point. The point is that God that created the mind is the same God that created the heart. He did not intend for the heart to be used in isolation from the mind. Neither did he intend for the mind to be used in isolation from the heart. There is that extreme where you're only using your mind to follow God. There is the other extreme where you're only using your heart to follow God. I am saying that you should not be on either side of the pendulum. Scripture says to love the Lord with your heart. Scripture says to love the Lord with your mind, with your mind, so that 
Hey. I don't have the time. But you see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul was describing something. And he talked about that though we walk, walk, in, walk in the flesh, that we do not walk after the flesh. Give me that scripture. That should be 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We, we walk in the flesh. We do not walk after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not what? They are not canal. But they are mighty through God. Eh? They are through God. They are mighty. What makes them mighty is that they are through God. And he talks that he, he calls them the weapons of our warfare. They are mighty through God. So they're pulling down of strongholds. And what do they do? What is the target of these weapons? Casting down imaginations. Where is the seat of imaginations? Where is the seat of imaginations? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against what? The knowledge of God. Where is the seat of knowledge? Where is the seat of knowledge? The mind. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. Where is the seat of thought? The mind. So this, this battle eh, is at the mind. That's what they are saying that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not carnal. So it means that there is a weapon that we will fight with bazooka. You know, you know bazooka? That's 10 hours stretch of praying. There are certain things that you can address in 10 hours. The other things that you cannot address in 10 hours, they will wait for you. If you like, pray 30 hours. When you are done, that thing will still be there. Because it's a different problem of its own. You know, you can have a wife that you love so much, and you keep buying her things. You sacrifice, you buy. You sacrifice, you buy. And she still tells you that you don't love me. And you are wondering. Or Abi, is he another wife that I married? Or am I, am I dreaming? That because you are not speaking her language. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you with me today? Uh -huh. I'm saying that there are certain problems. It is not a one, it's not one instrument for every problem. There are certain issues that you can use prayer to solve because of where they are located and the kind of problems that they are. There are other issues that they are in the mind. And the weapons for those problems have already been designed and they have been equipped by God that they are mighty through God these strongholds can be pulled down. But if they still erect themselves against the knowledge of God, it is simply because there are people that have not taken captive of that territory. God wants us to be balanced. Eh? And our relationship with him in our heart is secure. Our mind is secure. And this is getting me into what I want to do with you this morning. It's getting me into what I want to do with you this morning. So we, you and I believe that the Bible is the word of God. You believe that the Bible is the word of God. Why? Why? Why is the Bible the word of God and not the Quran? Because it's what? It's spirit. It's what? Inspired. inspired by God. The Quran claims to be inspired by God too. Has anybody done anything on Islam before here? You have been, maybe you have a former Muslim before. Okay. The Quran claims to be inspired by God. In fact, amazingly, the Quran affirms the inspiration of the previous scriptures, like the Torah, like the Psalms, like the Gospels which it calls the angels, the angel, it affirms their inspiration, right? It also affirms their preservation. And the Quran also affirms that it is inspired of God. So this is the case. The Muslim says, of course, your Bible is inspired by God. Our Quran is inspired by God too. Now, now, you don't believe the Quran is inspired by God, or do you? Because uh, these days we shouldn't make assumptions. <laughs> The things I have seen in real time. <laughs> you believe the Quran is inspired by God? Just, just wave to me. We have a counseling office at the back. We can see you and answer your questions later. You don't believe the Quran is inspired by God. But what is that thing that keeps, that makes the Bible different from the Quran? Why is the Bible inspired by God and the Quran is not? 
That's a very important question. You see, on this day, there are some, there are some assumptions or presumptions that you have brought to the table. Maybe probably because you were, you were born like that, all right? So there are some assumptions that you have brought to the table. And um, one of these assumptions is that the Bible is the word of God. In the day that they begin to ask you, why? What will you have to say? Because I know people that were once Christians and today are no longer Christians simply because the authority of scripture was questioned and they could not give answers to it. Because the truth is that everything that we know about God now, we know it from scripture. True or false? Even if you have a dream, I think it's in Jeremiah, and they were saying that if the prophet, have a, if the prophet has a dream, let him tell, tell his dream. But he that has my word, let him speak my word. He now says, what is the chaff in comparison with what? The wheat. Share I'm in church now. This is, you know the scripture I'm talking about. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 35, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, please. Thank you. Do you have that scripture for me? It's in Jeremiah 25. That the prophet that has a dream, let him speak. A dream. And he that has my word, let him teach my word with all diligence. Yeah, Jeremiah 23, yeah, sorry. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse what? 28. Jeremiah 23, 28. Thank you. Yeah, Jeremiah 23, 38, 28. Do we have it there? Great. The prophet that had a dream, let me tell a dream, and he that had my word, let me speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, said the Lord? There's a comparison that is going on here. This comparison is between dream and what? The word, and then chaff and what? Wheat. So you have to draw a table of words and opposites. Dream will be on one side. The next thing that will be on this other side is what? The word. It now says, what is the chaff compared to what? The width. The implication of that is that even if you have a dream or you have an encounter or you have a revelation, whatever it is that you have, we will test it by the word. If it does not pass the test of the word, it does not pass. This is to reiterate my point that whatever we know about God, we knew it from the word of God. So that means, if the devil comes for the word of God first, and it falls to the ground, hey, you have not seen to hold on to. True or false? That's why I want to start from here this weekend. I'll start from the word of God, from the scriptures, from the Bible, and then I'll go to, to Jesus. Uh, maybe by the evening I'll go to Jesus if I'm able to successfully do this this morning. All right. So let's go. Why do we think that, or why do we say, or why do we believe that the Word of God is is um, authentic or perfectly preserved? So I, I would like to title this my presentation this morning as "Can We Trust the Bible?" This is a very elaborate, elaborate teaching, and, um, but I'm going to try to compress it because I want your faith. Give me the next slide. I want your faith to be encouraged this morning. Can we trust the Bible? Let's move on, please. Let's move on. Um, okay, I think I have some things here. No, put that back up on the screen. That's the thing I want to use to run this morning. Can we trust the Bible? Now, the first thing I would like us to note is a few points. When we talk about the word Bible, mm, the Bible is not one book. The Quran is one book. Sorry, um, Islam will be receiving stray bullets a lot from this because 
it's, it's after Christianity. The next one I know is Islam. I don't know maybe your Ishekiri gods or all of that because they are not yet popular enough to be brought to the universal level. So Islam will be receiving a lot of stray bullets this morning. Um, bear with me, all right? Now we have the Bible, and it is not one book. If you have, on an academic level, done anything about um, research, you know, if you have written your project, at the back, there is a place that is called bibliography. You remember something like that? Now, that is a combination of two Latin words, biblio and graphe, right? Now, that word biblio is like books or a compendium of books. This is a section of the work that references all the materials that were used in compiling this piece. Are you with me? The word Bible is basically, or it, uh, that's the origin of that word. It is a library. It's a combination of books. It's a combination of books. Now, the Bible, well, it, it, it contains 66 books. Again, the Bible is not one book. It contains 66 books. 66 books. These 66 books were written over a period of about 1,500 years. They were written by about 40 different authors, and they were written in three continents. This is very important. You may not know why it is important, but it is very important. In comparison, the Quran, again, I say Islam will receive stray bullets today. In comparison, the Quran is one book having 112 chapters or 114 chapters, depending on the kind of Quran that you have. So you have 112 chapters or 114 chapters that was basically received by one man over a period of 23 years in one continent, in one nation, one country, basically speaking. What this means is this, that so there were about 40 different authors compiled what we now call the Bible within a period of 1,500 years, and they lived in three different continents of the world, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Hmm? And in the days, within the period of these 1,500 years, there were no internets. Are you with me? There were no internets at all. There were no phones. So there was no possibility for them to compare notes. I said, don't write this one. Write that one. Let us see how to leave this one out and put that one in. They, were, they could not have the opportunity to compare notes, number one. Number two, number two, they lived within a period of 1,500 years. So many of the authors did not meet themselves at all because they could not have. And the, this, this book, or the, yeah, this book, was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. In comparison, the Quran was written in just one language. This, this is why it is important. It is important because it tells you that God is not tribalistic. God is not, is not ethnic. God is not racially biased, right? So he uses three different languages, people from three different continents, to tell you that there is space for everyone. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Do you get the point I'm making today? All right. So this is just an introduction to, um, to, to the Bible. It is important for us because Christians believe that the Bible is the way that God discloses himself. I said earlier that everything that we know about God, we knew it from scripture. So the implication of this is that if the scriptures tell us all we know about God, if the scriptures tell us all we know about God, and we can find that the scriptures cannot be trusted, what is the implication of that? It means that what we know about God, we can't trust it. That is why this is important. I have told you that I personally know people who have left the faith because their confidence in the Bible was shaken. And so they left the faith. They couldn't take it anymore. Because if this tells you all, for instance, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible tells me so, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible tells me so, and 
and you find out that the Bible cannot be trusted. It means that you cannot trust that belief that you had. That's very important. Moreover, many times in conversations, many skeptics, many non-believers, from the beginning, throw out the Bible from the conversation. Don't bring Bible into this talk. They tell you, have you had those kinds of conversations before? From the beginning, they say, let's leave the Bible out. What, what they don't realize when they do this is that hidden in that statement is the assumption that the Bible cannot be trusted. We can't trust it. And many times, particularly Muslims, I ask them, why can we not trust the Bible? They say it is because it was written by man or by men, if you like. The Bible was written by men. Do Christians believe the Bible was written by men? Yes, we believe the Bible was written by men. No Christian believes the Bible was written with God's hand. True? The book of Matthew is generally, traditionally believed to be written by Matthew. It is named after the person that wrote it. The book of Mark, the same thing. The book of Luke. So these books, each of them, they have the names of their authors there. And so they are saying that we cannot trust the Bible because it was written by men. The question I normally ask is this. Do you trust the newspapers you read? The newspapers you read, do you trust them? That they are conveying the truth to you? Your books you read in school, your textbooks, do you trust them? That they are conveying the right information to you? If the answer to that question is yes, on what ground then can we not trust the Bible because it was written by men? If the answer to that question is no, that means we cannot trust anything at all. Because everything that we can read was written by men. The constitution of Nigeria, men that wrote it. If we cannot trust anything written by men, we cannot trust the constitution of Nigeria, right? True or false? When you go to the hospital and you do a test and they give you the result, uh, it was not a spirit that wrote that result. It was a man that wrote it. If you cannot trust anything written by men, you can't even trust your name. You can't trust anything. So it's not a valid objection to raise that because the Bible was written by men, we can't trust it. It's not a valid objection to raise at all. Do you understand what I'm saying? What we want to find out is that these men that wrote these things, are they reliable, number one? That's basically, anything, and that's how we look at anything that is written by anybody. People can write propaganda. The fact that people write propaganda does not mean that people cannot write the truth, right? So it is the responsibility of somebody who is careful and somebody who is interested in truth to see between what is true and what is false. If you get a, a story, you know, people come with different stories. Everybody comes with their different stories. If you want to get the truth, you need to get down and do the work of seeing between what possibly may be a fabrication, an exaggeration, a suppression, whatever you want, you want to call it. But you have to do the work. You cannot throw it out of the window simply because a man wrote it. If you're going to do that, you are going to throw everything out of the window. So the first thing I want to tell you is that it is not a valid objection to raise that because the Bible was written by men, it cannot be trusted. I see many people, pop, many people popularizing that view all over the internet. They are there everywhere. That is it not man that wrote it? Is it not man that wrote it? Can't men make, uh, make, make mistakes? If it is the word of God, how is it that King James wrote it? Somebody said that one. That if it is the word of God, how is it that King James? So he was referring, he was referring to the King James Bible. That if the Bible is the word of God, how did King James write it? He didn't get that. He didn't get it. So. It is not a valid objection to raise. It is not a valid objection to raise at all. That because it was written by men, it cannot be trusted. I have told you that everything that is ever written was written by men. Of course, men can lie. But that's not the point. Because men can lie does not mean all men have lied. Because one man broke your heart does not mean all men has come. That's a very important point. That many of us, and, and you don't, this is something that you, you, you apply to life and to living. So you cannot be turning the table upside down when you come to scripture or when you come to um, access the claims of Christianity. So, now I want to focus on the New Testament today because I cannot obviously do the New Testament, the Old Testament. This, this is a very elaborate teaching that on a normal day, I will need like six hours to 
trash everything that can be trash uh, as an introduction to this course. But for now, let's do what we can do in the next few minutes. All right? Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes, sir. All right. Is it the six hours that you... You people used to pray for 10 hours now. Six hours is not anything. Let me tell you a very short story. I started studying apologetics in 2017. This is 2022. I started, and I'm still studying apologetics. I started studying apologetics in 2017. Whatever I know now has been a work of five years and counting. So six hours in comparison to five years is not anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Hey, there are too many of you that after this meeting, you will go back and your interest will be piqued and you will seriously want to do it. I give you 10 years. In 10 years, you'll be amazed at how much God will do through you. I'm telling you, in 10 years, you'll be amazed at how much God will do through you. All right, so let's look at the New Testament a bit, and let's see what we can get from there. This is going to get interesting. Now, I'm going to talk about five things, and the five things I'm going to talk about would be the historical reliability of the New Testament manuscripts, the, real, the, the his, historicity of the, or, uh, of the New Testament manuscripts, the reliability of the manuscripts, the New Testament content, and the canon, and the apocrypha. I would see what I can do with all of this. I'll explain this as we go on. So let's start with historical reliability. This is one objection that many people bring to the table. So if you, for example, for example, you can verify, oh, we all have phones that can, that can um, um, browse, yeah? So we can, we can verify the things that I'm going to be seeing. Now, the book of Matthew, for instance, is many people place it between 80 to 85 AD. The book of Matthew, between 80 to 85 AD, the earliest of the gospels, the earliest of the Gospels would be the book of Mark that some people have placed at somewhere about 65 AD. Um, the epistles were written before the Gospels, right? The epistles were written first, then the Gospels were written. The latest of the Gospels was the book of John, right? So Mark was written, then Matthew was written, then Luke and Acts were written around the same time because uh, Acts was a sequel to Luke. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. And it's helped the arrive at all of these datings. That, that is a matter that I can't handle this afternoon. But this is the point. The point is that if the earliest of the, of the Gospels, for like Mark, was written at six, um, in the year 65 AD, the thing that Mark was referring to happened between 30 to 33 AD, or thereabouts, between that, between that time frame. So that means the Gospel of Mark was penned down 35 years after the event had happened. 35 years after the event had happened. That's number one. Number two, it was penned down by somebody that is not an eyewitness. That was not an eyewitness. Mark was not an eyewitness. You, remember, you know Mark now? John Mark. He was not an eyewitness. He was not part of the disciples of Jesus. He didn't even claim to be an eyewitness. So by one, 35 years after, is when he writes this episode, this gospel. Number two, he is not an eyewitness. How do we then know that what he wrote is reliable? If you meet people that know these things, these are the kinds of things they would ask you. How do we then know that it is reliable? Because it's not as if as Jesus was doing it, they were writing it down. Say, so, okay, like for example, the Sermon on the Mount, from chapter 5 to chapter 7, is the sayings of Jesus. How do we know that all of those things, this is what Jesus said? Right? Are you with me? Now, so the question then is, can we know anything from ancient history? Or from history? Let's even begin from history. Can we know anything from history at all? Do we need to be in a place to know if something happened? Number one. Number two, 
do we need to be there to be sure that we know what happened? Many of us who did not live during the Nigerian Civil War. Many of us did not, were not born during the Nigerian Civil War. At least the people that gave birth to me, I mean my own parents, were children during the Nigerian Civil War, right? So many of us were not born at that time. But is it therefore proper or accurate to say that because we were not there, we cannot know what happened during the Nigerian Civil War, which was just a little about 55 years ago? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Yes, so can we know anything from ancient history? So do we have to be there, number one? Number two, um, the time. Do, do we have to write it at the time when it happened to be sure that we know what happened? That's a very important question I would like for us to answer. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. So give me the very, the very next question. The very next um, verse. All right, the very next slide. Now, I, I'm reading this from the NIV. You can read it from your, your um, verse if it is too small for you to see from the screen. This is Luke's account. And I'm going to compare this to what Dwight Eisenhower said. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses. This is Luke speaking. And servants of the word, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Luke is saying from the beginning that I was not an eyewitness, but I interviewed the eyewitnesses. That's what Luke is saying. That I was interested in knowing things that, the things that, were most, that are most surely believed amongst us. That's what how the King James puts it. The things that are most surely believed amongst us. I, I, I want to put them into account so that I may, I may be able to write an orderly account for you. So what did I do? He said. I went to the eyewitnesses, one after the other, as I could find them. I interviewed them with this in mind. Since I myself have investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. Now, compare this to, give me the next slide. Compare this to what Dwight Eisenhower said about the, um, about the Holocaust in Germany. You heard of the Holocaust? How many of you have heard of the Holocaust? It's a very horrible um, event that happened in history. And in this event, they realized that before the Holocaust, let's assume that the Holocaust lasted for a period of three years. Assumption. At the beginning of the three years, and then at the end of the three years, there were six million Jews that were unaccounted for. Six million Jews disappeared at the end of the Holocaust, right? What happened to them was that they were wiped out. That's exactly what happened to them. So this man now said this. He said, I visited every nook and cranny of the camp, talking about the, the Nazi concentration camps, because I felt it my duty to be in a position from then on to testify at first hand about these things in case they ever grew up at home, they believe or assumption that the stories of Nazi brutality were just propaganda. I felt that the evidence should be immediately placed before the American and British publics in a fashion that we will leave no room for cynical doubt. Can you see the comparison between what this man is saying and what Luke was saying? Hmm? This man is saying that, that just in case people will wake up in the future and say that the Nazi brutality was propaganda. I decided to visit the camps myself. And I decided to experience these things firsthand so that I can write an account of the things that happened. Right? Uh -huh. As if he was prophesying, you know, this man had no idea what he was talking about. But as if he was prophesying, do you know that today as we speak, there are certain people that are trying to wipe out from history the reality that the Holocaust took place? But thank God for historians. This, this is the point that I'm trying to make. Can we know anything from history? Did we have to be there to ensure 
to be, to be certain that these things happen? The answer to that question is no. That's the answer to that question. What we need are accurate accounts of what happened. And there is a way to go about finding out accounts and sieving between accounts that are accurate and accounts that are not accurate. Um, I'll get to that in a moment if I have the time. Let's go on. Next slide. Okay, so how do we access historical truth? We access historical truth via number one, converging lines of evidence. If a crime happened now, and then bam, the, the crime happened, and everybody scattered, and then the police came, you know that that crime has become a historical event because it has passed. How can the first detective that came to that scene, how will he be able to know exactly what happened? Even though he was not there. There's nobody that goes to court to prosecute a criminal that they will ask him, were you there? And he says, no, he says, so how do you know what happened? No, but no serious person would, would, would bring that up because you can know things that happened even though you were not there. What do you do? Eyewitnesses, converging lines of evidence, photos, written accounts, and all of that. So the police people will come and they will begin to take statements from people that saw what happened. They begin to take statements from people that saw what happened, and as they do that, they begin to piece together a theory of what it was that happened you know, um, at that event. Now, this is the point I want to make, and I want to make it very quickly, that historical events can be known with certainty even when we were not there. So we cannot bring it up as a plausible objection that the people that wrote the Gospels or the people that wrote anything here, yeah, anything, any of the things that happened in the Gospels were not there. So therefore, we cannot say that they knew for certain what happened. Even to till now, his, we know for certain that certain things happened in history, even though we ourselves were not there when those incidents happened. Now let's go to the next slide. So let's come back to the reliability of the manuscripts. Now, when we're talking about manuscripts, we are talking about the handwritten documents of the New Testament. What we have now are the printed copies of those manuscripts as they were you know, compiled together. Hmm? True? You people, eh? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Ah, OK. So I should start teaching by faith, Abby with the assumption that you are understanding. All right, now there are manuscripts. These manuscripts, these manuscripts were handwritten, handwritten copies of the original autographs. They were, the autographs were what, like what Mark wrote, or what Paul wrote, for instance. So this is the point. I'll give you an example. Please come, sir. The man in yellow, come. I want you to stand here. Just stand and face this man. Sir, you come. Come, stand and face the audience. All right, now give, look at this. So this is Apostle Paul. Is, is your name Paul? Okay, so this is Apostle Paul, all right? Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the Philippians in, in AD 55 or AD 54, as the case may be. He's writing a letter to the Philippians. Now, this is AD 54. Now, this is AD 1200, right? This is AD 1200. The original manuscript was written in AD 54. We now have a manuscript that the date is 1,200. How can we know that what we have in 1,200 is identical with what the original man wrote? Is there a possibility that between AD 54 and AD 1200, some drastic changes have happened. Is there a possibility? Is there a possibility that somebody just maliciously decided to stand up and change the writings of Paul so that it will make it say something completely different from what Paul said? Is there, is there a possibility like that? So how can we then know if, for instance, the manuscript we have is AD 1200? How can we then know that what we had in AD 1200 is what is the same thing with what Paul wrote in AD 54. That is where our discussion starts from. It's not emotions. This is not emotions at all. If you are going to disprove the reliability of the New Testament text, it is at that level we begin to disprove it. 
if we can see conclusively, for instance, that what was written or what we have or the copy, for example now, the King James Bible, the King James Version of the Bible um, was compiled in 1611. Hmm? In the year 1611, that was when it was compiled. It was compiled with manuscripts that they could, make, they could find available at the time. And many of these manuscripts were newer manuscripts. And by newer manuscripts, I mean, okay, so if there is a distance between 54 and 1200, whatever we find closer to 54 is old, right? Whatever we find closer to 1200 is new. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the people that now wrote the King James Bible, if all they had was what was around this environment, hmm? What they had is the new manuscripts. If they didn't have anything around this environment, that means they didn't have the old manuscript. And that's exactly what happened. So we now find out that when we now discover the old manuscripts, we now want to compare. Do, the thing that we had before, is it different from what we, we, what we have now? That's exactly where this discussion comes through. I'm trying to simplify this thing. It's a very academic way of putting this thing to you, but I'm trying to make you understand it. Now, when we're talking about the authenticity of the, of the, the manuscripts, because what we want to first find out is, number one, the things that were recorded, um, are we in a place, are we in a state to know if the things that were recorded, if the people that wrote what they wrote are reliable? That's the first thing we want to know. Because if somebody just sat down somewhere and just wrote anything, <laughs> There's the possibility that he just fabricated issues. And the thing that, happen, that he said it happened did not happen at all. We want to get that out of the table. After we have gotten that out of the table, we want to find out that if we find out that he's a reliable eyewitness or is a reliable historian, the thing that we have now, is it the same thing with what he wrote? That's another point that needs to be made. Because there is a possibility that he is a reliable eyewitness and he wrote what he knew to the best of his knowledge. But what we have now is completely different from what he gave to us. And in the evening, I'll show you an example of something like that. In the evening. And I need to wrap this up very quickly so that we can get out of here. So this is the point. That first of all, we want to check about, can we know anything from ancient history? That's the first question. The manuscripts, are they reliable? Are they reliable? Okay, so you can go back to your seats. Thank you. So the manuscripts were written with papyrus and parchments, and the integrity of an ancient document is usually determined by the number of manuscripts or fragments that exist. So this is the point. Now, the more the manuscripts, the more reliable the story. If you are in a class and they are dictating something, somebody is dictating, dictating something, and then you are writing. You know that as, as you are doing that writing, sometimes you may miss some sentences. Hmm? Then you now go to your neighbor and say, I beg, make I check if you got this. And you now find out that the handwriting of this person was so awful, you could not see it. Has it happened to you before? If it was only two of you that were in that class, and the secret things belong to the Lord, right? But if you people were like 30 in that class, if you people were up to 30, in that class, you know what you can do? You have other people that have the same material that you can compare with. The more the manuscripts, the more reliable it is. You get that point now. You know, Paul made the same argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul made the same argument. When he was talking about the resurrection of Jesus, he said that he, he appeared to Peter. Then he appeared to James. Then he appeared to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500. He says some of them have slept, but the majority are still with us. Do you know what Paul was saying? It's not only me that has this story. You can ask Peter. You can ask James. There are, there are another 500 people that where well, most of them are still around, and you can go out there. If you go out there, you will meet firsthand the people that saw Jesus when he resurrected. That's basically what he was saying. The more the more the manuscripts, the more reliable um, it is. That's number one. Number two, apart from the number of manuscripts, so give me the next slide. Let's, let's move, let's move. Give me the next slide. Apart from the number of ma manuscripts that, that there are, another thing that we want to find out is the age of the earliest copy. You know, remember I told you that there are manuscripts 
and they are autographs. The autographs are what Paul wrote. Eh? And in those days, they didn't have, um, they didn't have a photocopying machine. So if you needed to get a copy of the letter Paul wrote, the only way you have to do it is to write it. You, you can't snap it and say, ah, you have to. And, and I believe that God intentionally revealed his word in that time period so that this thing can be preserved in parchments. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hey, that's, that's by the way. So I remember there was an uncle of mine. How many of you have read this book, Why Revival Tarries? You have read that, like Leonard Ravenhill, right? The first time I read that book, he sets me on fire. I hope he did so to you too. He sets me on fire. I have an uncle that read that book and immediately he began to burn. And he, because he came to our, my dad's house, then my dad was not yet um, married at the time. So he came to my dad's house, he saw that book and he began to burn. And he was to travel back and he was not sure if he would see that book anywhere again. You know what he did? He sat down and copied it in his book, page by page so that he can have a copy of why revival tarries by hand that's what he did yes if you if you saw an epistle from paul and you didn't have a phone or a photocopy won't you copy it down ah you are you acting as if you are surprised this is exactly what they did in those days so paul will say that okay there is there is an epistle that i've written to these people ensure that this epistle i'm writing now is read in your church and then collect the one I read I wrote to them and read it in your church and send this one to them how will they send it to them it is by copying are you understanding what I'm saying as they copied like that they were creating manuscripts that's what they were doing as they were copying they were creating manuscripts so number one the number of manuscripts the age of the earliest copy the thing that I, is, that I use to describe the reliability of a manuscript, the number of manuscripts, the age of the earliest copy, and the time span between the earliest copy and when the text was written. So if this text was written in AD 54, for instance, and we have a manuscript that is AD 70, are you with me? That is 16 years between when this one was written, and this one was written, right? If you have another manuscript that is AD 300, that's over 200 years. So, the one that will be more reliable will be the manuscript that is closer to, to when the original one was written. If you find any differences between these two manuscripts, you are going to discard the later one and go for the earlier one because this earlier one was closer to what to when the original one was written so the idea is that if you want to change anything if you want to change anything there are people that have the original one in their hand that can correct you like now a newspaper that was a newspaper that comes out today if you have a copy of the newspaper if you want to change your copy of the newspaper today you are just deceiving yourself because there are so many other copies available because it was released today. How many of you still have newspapers from 1992? Many of us may not have newspapers from 1992. Now think about newspapers from 1854. So imagine that somebody has just one copy of a newspaper that was written in 1854 and that's the only copy available. He can say anything out of that copy and make it say what he wants it to say because there is no way to compare. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So there is the number of manuscripts, there's the age of the earliest copy, the time span between the earliest copy and when the text was written. Don't forget these three things. Very important. All right, give me the next slide. And I'll show you um, how this, this works for us. I'm going to compare, I'm going to compare some ancient manuscripts that we believe are authentic. We believe that they are authentic some ancient works rather. But because of their number of manuscripts, we believe that they are authentic. And then I'll compare it with the manuscripts of the Bible. And then let's see um, how the Bible does. Let's see how the Bible does. But now this says that the quality of the evidence of documents that, are detail, that detail ancient history were determined by the distance between the evidence and the first written text, not by its distance to us. Now this is absolutely important. How we, have, how we take to know 
or the authenticity or the reliability or, of a manuscript is not from the distance of the manuscripts to us. It is the distance between when the manuscript was written and when the original one was written. So you can have a manuscript that is dated, let's say, AD 600, for instance. Because time has passed does not mean that it has lost its credibility. No, that's not what it means. What you are going to compare is the distance between when the manuscript was written originally and when this copy was made. So, this is the point I was telling you earlier, that the events of the, the, events of the life of Jesus and when they were written happened within a period of 35 years. About that time. So, Jesus died in eight, about AD 30. The first guy that wrote about it was Mark in AD 65. That is 35 years. Is it possible that he may have missed some things? It's possible that he may have missed some things. Is it reasonable to think that he did so? Because the people that lived in the time of Jesus, but 35 years is too small a time for a generation to be wiped out. But do you understand what I'm saying? There are some of us that still remember things that happened in 1987. Some of you still remember 1987 as if it was yesterday. Right? And the distance between 1987 and today is just 35 years. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are there people that lived, that were adults in 1987, that are still alive till today? Are there people that were adults in 1987 that are still alive till today? Of course there are. Many of them are still alive till today. So, so... We don't, it's not the distance between, <laughs> between the, when the manuscript was written and us. It is the distance between when the event happened, when the story was written, when the account was written, and also the, the distance between when that first account was written and when the copy was made. Give me the next slide. So this is where it gets interesting. Now, I'm going to give you certain accounts, and let's see how the Bible does in, in the midst of this. You have heard of Caesar, Julius Caesar. It's Julius Caesar that is the case here. Julius Caesar, the accounts of the story of Julius, or Julius Caesar lived from between 100 BC to 44 BC. Right? Are you with me? Stay with me. From between 100 BC to 44 BC, that's when he lived. The earliest copy the earliest copy of the life of Julius Caesar was written in AD 900. The earliest copy of the account of the life of Julius Caesar was written in AD 900. The time span is 1,000 years. 1,000 years. The number of manuscripts that we have, we are just 10, of the life of Julius Caesar. According to historians, this is enough. We have enough. Are you with me? We have enough to know about what happened within the lifespan of Julius Caesar. We have 10 manuscripts about his life. 10 manuscripts about his life. These manuscripts, the distance between the earliest manuscripts and the life of the man is about 1,000 years. About 1,000 years. And yet we have enough to know. Plato, Plato, Plato lived between 427 and 347 BC. The earliest copy of the works of Plato, the, of course, there are essays that Plato wrote that we have now. The earliest copies of the works of Plato um, is dated to AD, AD 900. That's a time span of 1,200 years. The number of manuscripts we have, seven. And yet, we believe that we have the works of Plato. All right. Now, Thucydides lived between 460 and 400 BC. Earliest copy, 900. Time span, 1,300 years. Number of manuscripts, eight. Tacitus. Tacitus was was um, a historian. Was a historian. He lived in the second century. All right. So he lived from um, 100 AD upward. The earliest copy of the works of Tacitus is dated AD. 100, AD 100. The time span is 1,000 years. Number of manuscripts, 20. Suetonius lived between 75 and 160. The earliest copy of his manuscripts, 950. Time span, 800 years. Homer, how many of you have read Homer's Iliad? 
Homer's Iliad is a compendium of stories. Oh, okay. Homer's Iliad, Homer lived 900 BC. Read the, you've heard of, um, how many of you have watched this movie? Um, Thor, is it Thor? No, 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 it's not Thor. Um, yes, it's Thor. You heard of the story of, of um, this, these guys that went to fight and then they brought in Trojan horse. You heard of the Trojan horse? You heard of the Trojan horse? Aha. That story was told by Homer. It was Homer that told that story. Um, Achilles, there's a movie out of that. What's the name of that movie? It's Troy. That's what I was saying, right? It's Troy. Aha. There's a movie out of that. So it was written by Homer. That story was written by Homer. And it was, it was written around 900 BC. The earliest copy of the manuscript that we have, 400 BC. Time span, 500 years. And this is the most manuscripts that we have, 643 manuscripts. Now, the New Testament was written between 40 AD and 100 AD. The earliest copy of the manuscript that we have is 125 AD. The time span is 25 to 50 years. The number of manuscripts is over 24,000. Now, if you are going to throw out the New Testament, that means you are going to throw out, or, and that means we cannot know anything about ancient history. Because in comparison, the New Testament is not the meat of any of those things there. We are confident that we know about Julius Caesar, even though the earliest of the copies of the manuscript that we have has a time span of 1,000 years. We are confident that we know about Plato, even though the, the earliest copies of the manuscript that we have has a time span of 1,200 years. How can we then say that we are not confident that we know about the life of Jesus when the earliest of the copies of the manuscript that we have is just 25 years? For God's sake, 25 years is not a lifetime. There is nobody who was alive when Plato wrote anything that he wrote that was alive at the time when we have the earliest copy of his manuscript. There is nobody. So we can't even know if there was any alteration that happened. Are you understanding what I'm saying? But apart from the fact that the time span is so short for the New Testament, we have so many manuscripts of the New Testament, over 24,000 from ancient history. We have over 24,000 of these manuscripts that we can use to compare to see if what we have is reliable. Now it gets interesting. Let's go on. Let's go on. Now this, listen to what this man says. He says to be skeptical of the resultant text of the New Testament books is to allow all of classical antiquity to slip into obscurity. You cannot be skeptical of the New Testament manuscripts and still hold confidently all the, the, the classics or all, uh, all the documents of, the, of, of classical antiquity. You can't do that because there is no basis for comparison. You can't be comparing 643 to 24,000. There's no basis for comparison. Now, so if you are skeptical of the resultant text of the New Testament, it means that you are going to allow all of classical antiquity to slip into obscurity. For no documents of the ancient period are as well attested bibliographically as the New Testament. The implication of this is that if you doubt anything of the New Testament, after what was written, you have to throw everything from ancient history because, because there is a wide body of manuscripts to attest to what was written in the New Testament. But that is not all. You think that's all, but, but that's not all. Let's go on. Now there's the Dead Sea Scrolls that comes to mind very quickly. Now the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls is a very interesting story. Somewhere, somewhere around, AD 19, uh, around 1947, it was just in the previous century, in the last century, a little shepherd boy was playing around the Dead Sea. And around the Dead Sea, there were some caves there. So he was playing, he was taking care of his sheep, his, his flock, and he was playing. And he picked up a stone and began to throw it into the caves. As he threw it into one of the caves, he heard the sound of pottery shattering, like clay pots shattering. And so he entered into the cave. And what he saw were jars, like jars of clay pots. All right? This was 1947. Don't forget that. 1947. Inside these jars, there were scrolls. Inside these jars, there were scrolls. And these scrolls had been preserved for about 1,900 years. 
The scrolls contained both scriptural and non-scriptural manuscripts. Very important. Now, in these scrolls, a complete copy of the book of Isaiah was found, as we have it today. Now, these scrolls dated over 1,900 years. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That means these jars were there when Jesus walked the earth. These jars were there when Jesus walked the earth. Now, a complete copy of the book of Isaiah was found, and it was dated to 125 BC. 125 years before Jesus, that scroll was a complete copy of the book of Isaiah. And fragments of all the Old Testament books. Between this text and the early Masoretic text, which was dated to about AD 9, 916, 1,000 years difference, the text have a 95% word-to-word accuracy. So this is what they did. By 1947, we already had our Bibles, right? So what they did was, that, and this is what, that's what they call the Masoretic text, because our Bibles were, you know, were translated from the Masoretic text. So they compared these Dead Sea Scrolls that were dated before of course, before 100 years before Jesus Christ came, they compared them to what we have. And what they found was a 95% word-to-word accuracy. This is not just that the meaning is the same, but the words have changed. Word-to-word accuracy, and the remaining 5% are minor variations, such as spelling differences, like how somebody will spell Palo in American and spell Palo in British. Are you with me? 95% what, what um, the remaining 5% are minor variations, such as spelling differences and the use of different conjunctions. This scroll, what they helped in doing was to support the fidelity of the Masoretic texts or the Old Testament texts as we have it. So what have we done so far? One of the things we have found out is that number one, number one, we have sufficient manuscripts to attest that the text of the New Testament could not have been altered. These texts, these manuscripts were available in different places all over the world. And given their limited technology at the time, they could not be, you could not have had a, a coalition to ensure that all the manuscripts say the same thing. It's like somebody deciding to change a newspaper that was written today. That's, that's going to be a joke. So we have over 24,000 manuscripts. The dates of those manuscripts from the time when the original autographs were written is about 25 to 50 years. Comparing this with other works of ancient history, they are not a match at all. So if we are going to say the Bible is not reliable, it means we cannot know anything about ancient history. And nobody wants to be that kind of sacrifice. No matter how skeptic you want to be, you cannot make that kind of sacrifice. So it is, it is, it is agreed across board that the New Testament that we have today is the same New Testament that they had in the days of the first apostles. Nothing has changed. Do you understand what I'm saying? The nothing has changed. The words has not changed. Nothing has changed. So the next thing we want to find out is, okay, the people that wrote it, did they write the truth? Because the fact that the, the manuscripts have been preserved does not mean that the truth has been preserved. You, can, you could have successfully preserved the lie. Right? So the people that wrote the original, since the original have been preserved, do we have what actually happened? That's what we want to find out right now. Give me the next slide, please. Very quickly, we are going... All right, so some of the people who reject the New Testament do, do not do it because they, re, they reject, they doubt the historical authenticity, but because of their a priori commitment to materialism. So they, 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 they doubt the things that happen in the New Testament simply because the Bible contains miracles. That's the first problem that they have. If you do not believe that God exists, for instance, you cannot believe in miracles. You need a God to have miracles. You need a God that is outside, like a classic miracle is the raising of the dead. You can explain away every other one. But how can you explain that somebody died? For example, Jesus, the case of Jesus Christ, for instance, 
It's a historical fact that he died. How can you explain then that he rose from the dead? That you need a God to explain that. And if you do not believe in God, you are going to discard that one immediately. Right? And so you're going to find out, to make, and that's exactly what makes people to ensure that they throw away what the New Testament writes because of miracles. Nobody has any problem with what Plato wrote. Plato did not put miracles in his book. Nobody has any problem with what Aristotle wrote. He didn't put miracles in his book. But when you're going to look at Luke and John and Matthew, no, you're going to have a problem with what they wrote. Because, because miracles are involved. So that's the first problem. It's miracles. But look, let's look at the eye, eyewitnesses. These eyewitnesses had exceptional accuracies. These eyewitnesses, they knew names. They knew places. They knew the names of rivers, water bodies. How about now? I, it's my first time in Worry, right? I can assume that you people have rivers in Worry. But I cannot know the names of which rivers you have. It will take somebody that lives in Worry or somebody that knows somebody that lives in Worry that ha and they have a very good relationship together that, are, that will be able to name rivers, including their names and where they are located. In the book of John, you have a pool called Bethesda. In the synoptics, you have a pool called Siloam. Right? They give you the names of streets. They give you the names of villages. They give you the names of people and their surnames. They have Simon the Zelotes. They have Simon Bajona. They have Simon the Leper. It will take somebody who knows the people to be able to know that this is not just a Simon. This is a Simon the Leper. He was called Simon the Leper. This is a Mary of Magdala. This is the Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. This is the Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is Judas Iscariot. This is Judas, not Iscariot. It will take somebody who knows the people to be able to know that much. For instance, if I was to say I came to RCM Warren, at very best, I could know just your first names if I try hard enough. I cannot know the names that they call you in the community. Abi, in the community, there are names you call yourselves. You have names that you call each other that only someone that has been initiated will find out. So it will be easy, therefore, and listen to this, it will be easy, therefore, to spot a fabrication. If somebody is going to be writing about this community, about this assembly, and they are making stories up, it will be easy for people in this community to spot the lie because they are in the community. Now, the manuscripts, the New Testament documents were written within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. They were written within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses, so it will be easy for them to call out a lie that no, this thing did not happen like this. Because the eyewitnesses were still alive when these documents were recorded. Are you with me this morning? Yes, Great. Are you having a good time? Yes, so exceptional accuracy. They were so accurate. And I don't have one of the one of the historians, one of the historians of the first Matthew McClick and John, that they doubted a lot was Luke the physician. They didn't believe Luke the physician at all because of the way he wrote his story. But <laughs> after, after some very careful work had been done over the years, they found out that Luke was a historian of the first degree. There is no single thing that Luke... Ah, do I bring it up now or later? In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16 or chapter 18, one of those, when they were introducing Aquila and Priscilla to us, Luke did not just introduce Aquila and Priscilla. Luke told us how Aquila and Priscilla came to settle in Ephesus. Do you remember? He said that they had driven, the time came when they had driven all the Jews from Rome. That was how Aquila and Priscilla came to settle. And, and Liu, while writing that, was writing it as a side comment. That was not the point he was trying to make, but he was trying to introduce Aquila and Priscilla, that they came to, to, to live in, in, um, in um, Ephesus. After that, Caesar had asked 
Let's go to that scripture. That should be Acts chapter 16. Um, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first verses. Okay, Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Verse, verse 1 and verse 2. Is it possible to... Aha! After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, verse 2, verse 2, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife, Priscilla. Because, you see that because is in brackets. So that's not the point he was making. He just was telling, I know Aquila and Priscilla. That's the point he was trying to make. Because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. Do you know that they got to find out that it was recorded, it was recorded in history around the second, around the first century, that Claudius at the point was the emperor of Rome at the, at the, at the time, that he gave a decree that every Jew, because there were some issues that they had in Rome at the time, and the decree he gave was that all Jews should evacuate Rome with immediate effect. Luke mentioned that event. Historians or scholars independently found out, out outside of the Bible. It was recorded by the Roman government of, of the time. Do you know what that does to the book of Acts of the Apostles? That Leo knew what he was writing about. Are you understanding what I'm saying? In Luke, in, in, in Acts of the Apostles, Luke talked about a famine. Where is that now? When he was talking about Apollos, that Apollos gave, in those days, came, came um, prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, right? And then Agapos now prophesied about a famine. And Luke said that, and this famine happened in the day of, that should be Acts chapter 13. Um, yeah, Acts chapter 13. Uh, let me get that right. Give me one minute. Uh, can you find that scripture for me? Um, Agabo, sorry, not, not Apollos. Did I say Apollos? All right, Acts chapter 21, and that's verse 9 and verse 10. Yeah, okay, verse 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. All right, sorry. Okay, yeah. So, now go to Acts chapter 11, verse 20, 27, yeah. Acts, yeah, okay, so that I, was, I was correct. Acts eleven twenty seven. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them, named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great death, that's famine, throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So Luke was referring to a famine that happened in the days of Claudius. This same Claudius. Do you, you remember that? Now, it is recorded in the history of Rome itself that there was a famine in the days of Claudius. What, at least, even if, except you, the devil is doing extra time on your matter. You will know that Luke knew what he was writing about. All right, so take me back to my slides very quickly as I begin to wrap this up. Do you have questions you want to ask? Does anybody have questions you want to ask? I, I, would, I could make time for that at the end of this. Go back to my slides, please. Um, yeah, good, good. So the accuracy. They mention names like Simon Peter, Simon the Zealot, Simon the Tanner, Simon of Cyrene. We see similar things with Jameses. They had names of James. They had James and their surnames, right? Judas, John, and names of towns, villages, and all of that. That's number one. They were exceptional in their accuracy. It means that they knew what they were writing about. Number two, they included embarrassing testimony. Embarrassing testimony is, it means testimony you are not proud of. That's the meaning of embarrassing testimony. Testimony you are not proud of. If you are going to make up a story, you are not going to make yourself look bad in the story. Basically, you will make yourself look bad in the story. In the New Testament, the heroes of the New Testament are made, 
at, with the uh, issues or stories about them that do not really put them in a good light are being described. For example, Jesus calls Peter Satan. Jesus calls Peter Satan. No, now. If you were making up a story, you are going to leave that out. But the reason why they could not leave that out is because that is exactly how it happened. Right? That the disciples did not believe in Jesus. That at the point when Jesus went to be crucified, the disciples ran away. That is a, an embarrassing testimony. For example, in the book of John, in John's Gospel, when, remember that, that sprints to the tomb? That sprints to the tomb. After Mary had come back and said, I have seen the Lord. And then Peter and John began to run to the tomb. It was John that was writing it. But you realize that in the story, John was letting you understand that I'm the one that wrote this thing, and I have run Peter to the tomb. Did you see that in his writing? Uh -huh. That he had, he had run him to the tomb. People that write will write and put themselves in a good light. The disciples, this, the, 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 the Gospels describe issues that were embarrassing to the disciples. Like they ran away and left Jesus. That after the resurrection, they went back to fish. These were things that were embarrassing, and yet they included it. A classic example again would be that he resurrected, he rose from the dead. Okay, how do you know? Our women told us about it. This is unheard of. Because given their context, given their time, um, the testimony of women was not admissible at all. For you to get it, in those days, for you to get a, a testimony, to believe the testimony of a woman, you need four women to one man. Because women were believed to be impossible liars. Right? Do you remember in John chapter 8, when that woman was brought to Jesus that was caught in adultery in the very act, she was brought to alone. Yes, no. But she was caught in the very act too. But she was brought alone. That was not a, a society that favored women at all. And the disciples, the same disciples that came, from, that were grew up in that environment, are the ones that will put women in the front. The only way they could do this is because they were compelled by the truth of the events to present the matter as it happened. So, if you are making up a story, you are going to leave out any. If you are going to tell a story, we did that a lot when we were children. So you fight amongst yourselves. And then your parents come to ask you what happened. You realize that everybody is going to tell the story to make himself the victim. If you have children, you see that happen a lot. That they will, they will put so, as a parent, you have to hear both sides. Then you will know exactly what happened. Because this one will say, it is not me. It is, it is, or I was not even there. I just came and saw that the place are on the ground. So, <laughs> so, the disciples, they included embarrassing testimony. That's number two. Number three, they suffered excruciating deaths. Now, this is where we don't understand. Because if I am going to lie, there is only how far I can lie. When people begin to die for a lie, I will come out with the truth. Abby? If we, are, if we all agree to lie about something, and then we now realize that they are said they're beating people, only beat you. They have not brought nail first. I was beaten. People will begin to say, uh, actually, there is how this thing happened. Let's not overreact to something. There is how this thing happened. Ah, beat care for something that I know is not true. But you see, the, the, the first disciples of Jesus that were eyewitnesses of this thing, they went to the death. Many of them suffered deaths that were so painful that you could not imagine it. Many of them were some of them were dragged on the streets. They were tied to a horse and dragged naked across the streets. If you see that thing happening to your colleague, and you know you people agree to lie, you will say, they won't drag me, oh. This thing, nobody, nobody, nobody will drag me. And you are going to come out and say, actually, the real thing that happened <laughs> is that they paid us money <laughs> to do this thing. But none of the eyewitnesses recanted their testimony. They all went to the death, to the death, holding the thing that they confessed. The only explanation that is reasonable is that they were saying the truth. Do you understand what I'm saying? They were saying the truth because apart from the fact that they were dying, people could die to protect their, their, a lie. But almost nobody 
would watch his family die because of a lie. The sons and daughters of these men were fed to lions. Yes. And I'm going to show you something in the evening, um, a quote in the evening. They tell you how excruciating the death. You know now we have street lights. We have street lights in the night. In those days, it was the bodies of Christians that were used as street lights in the night. When they killed them, they set their body on fire, and that is how they illuminate their streets. So for people to see it as an example. And what were, they, what, were they, what were they saying? They were saying that Jesus is God and he rose from the dead. That was their offense. Right? If they were knowing, if they knew that what they did was a lie, of course they would not go to the death with that kind of a testimony. Let's go to the next slide as I begin to wrap this up. So there are only three conclusions we can make from this. The first conclusion we can make from this is they were deceived. They were not lying, you know, but they were lied to. And so they believed the lie, thinking that it was the truth. The second conclusion we can make from this is that they intentionally lied. And I'll try to show you how this is almost impossible to believe. The third conclusion we can make from this is that they told the truth. Now, remember what I was saying earlier, that it is possible for the manuscripts to, be, to have been preserved, and the lie was preserved. Is it reasonable so far to believe that it was the lie that was preserved, given everything that we have seen so far? So the question comes back to, can we trust the Bible? And I'm just, this is just the Gospels that I'm talking about. I've not said anything about the Epistles. Of course, I have not said anything about the Epistles. I've not said anything about the Canon. But this is just the Gospels. And this is important. The reason why I'm focusing on the Gospels is because the Gospels tell us the story of the life of Jesus. They tell us the story of the life of Jesus. Can these words be trusted? There's something that is more important than what I'm doing now. And that thing is that God took great care to ensure that revelation is gotten to you unadulterated. It will be an abuse on the grace of God for us not to care about the thing that God has taken so much care to hand over to us. I remember when my wife was pregnant one time that she could not, she could not eat any food that she cooked. I don't know why that happens. But there is food in the house, and you cannot eat it. So I had to go and look for food. <laughs> On the way, when I was leaving the house, because it was not a far distance, when I was leaving the house, there was no sign that rain was going to fall. I had bought the food, and I started coming back. And then the heavens were opened. And it poured. What was in my mind that day was to preserve the food. Let water not enter this thing. That's the most important thing. Imagine I got in through all of that, going through the tick and the thing, and I came back and said, what is this? I can't eat this thing. <laughs> my sister, you eat it too. <laughs> ah, this one, you are going to eat this one. <laughs> Even if you are wicked, the pain, Whatever humiliation that I have gone through to bring this to you. Many times, many times, we accept gifts, not because we think the gifts are valuable, but because we think the people are valuable. God went through so much to bring his word to us. People went through so much to bring that to us it will be insensitive for us to not care. Because I said earlier that the word of God reveals the mind of God to us. True? True. If God will take so much, look at that table, put that table back up for me. If God will go through so much to ensure that his counsel is overwhelmingly, because there are people that this thing will not convince. 
There are people that even if Jesus appears now, they won't be convinced. But that, it's not them that God is, 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 is concerned about. It's you. It's you. So if he has taken so much pain to communicate his counsel to you by his word, it will be an insult. It will be a great act of disservice for you not to care about what he had to say. So he said, always be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you the reason for the hope that we have. Every time that I pick up my Bible, every time that I pick up my Bible, there is something that I know. I know that I'm not, I don't just have words printed on paper. I have the very mind of God. It is the mind of God that I have. God communicated his mind to me through this. Many times this thing has saved my life. I have stories to share with regards to this, but I have a very high value for the word of God. And this thing has been sponsored massively by apologetics. Yes. That God went through pain. God went through care to ensure that his mind was transmitted to me via his word. It will be an act of disservice on my part for me not to be committed to the word. And so I want to charge you this afternoon, my friends, that the things that we have, we have been handed over to are sacred. Jude said that we should earnestly contend for the faith that was handed over to the saints. People died to preserve what you are having now. You are, you are not called to die for it. Nobody says you should come and die for this thing. There are so, so many of us that if rain falls, they won't see us in church that day. You don't have transport money, you can't come to church. People transmitted manuscripts from continent to continent by foot. No one was reading about the life and missionary, life and ministry of the missionary called Paul. Paul the Apostle, how Paul took the word of God from Asia to Europe. Eh? Most of the time, he went by foot. Paul will be, will be incarcerated and he cannot, he cannot travel. He will now, in order to communicate his mind, he will write down letters and give it to people. These people will travel through deserts. And in those days, remember the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus was talking about that man that joined it from Jericho, uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. And on the way, he was waylaid. People went through the, the, the risk of robbers in order to hand over manuscripts to people. You knew that this journey that you are going, you may not come back from it. But there is something that you have been given and you will guard it with your life. It's a risk worth taking. You are just a recipient. They just gave you the thing. And it has been closed for three months. You have never opened it before. The mind of God. And then you are wondering, you are asking God and say, God, why have you forsaken me? His word is there. That is supposed to be light onto your path. To show you how you need to walk. Paul writing to Timothy. He said, I write these things to you so that you will know how you ought to comport yourself in the house of God, which is the ground and the pillar of truth. I am writing this to you. God knows how you ought to live. You don't know how you ought to live. You have no idea. The one that made you knows how you ought to live. And there are many parameters that can be, that can be, that can be compromised, that can be corrupted. If God was to use those parameters to... But many of you think that if God sends me a dream, uh, why can't God just appear now? Have you heard of hallucinations? You know, you can actually think you are seeing a vision. And it is just a medical... There are some drugs that doctors can give you and you see your forefathers. Are you aware? It's no encounter came. There are drugs that they can give you and you actually see people. There are so many portals, there are so many, there are so many avenues that can be contaminated, that can be compromised. And so if you are there praying that, God, give me a dream. Ecclesiastes will tell you that a dream comes from a multitude of businesses. There is one that is sure. Nobody can shake it. And God ensured that through centuries it was perfectly preserved so that you can know what to do because you don't know what to do. You have no idea what to do. As, see, my life till I am standing here now has been ordered by God's word. It has been ordered by God's word. 
when it was time for me to marry, how I got to know who to marry, how I got to know who to not marry, rather, how I got to know who to not marry, because at the time I was point man of RCN Ibadan, as I still am now, and we had so many sisters around, I just came up from a very, it's a long story, but I, I was asking the Lord, is there anyone amongst this one that you have prepared for me? And he took me to the place of prayer, and I began to pray, and he took me to Genesis chapter 2. Took me to Genesis chapter 2. That's how God speaks to me when I was born again earlier till this day. God speaks to me through his word. And in Genesis chapter 2, he says, and he brought all the, the field of the, of the earth, the, um, the, the flock of the earth to Adam to see what he will call them and whatsoever name Adam gave them, that was their name thereof. But for Adam, there was no help, meat for him. You will read that thing and you will see Genesis chapter 2. That day, God spoke to me that these people have been brought for you to name. There is no help here, meet for you. That was how I knew that the person I will marry will not come from the assembly I was pastoring. You don't know what to do with your life, I assure you. I say that God has communicated his mind to you via his word. And he has taken great pain to ensure that it was perfectly preserved. You will do great disservice to the kingdom if you do not pay attention to the thing that God has preserved over the years for you. It is for you. It is for you. It is for you. I want you to come to God this afternoon with a commitment. That I will sanctify Christ as Lord in my heart. And I will pay attention to the ancient words. For it is in this one that I will get direction. It is in the word that I will find liberty. It is in the word that I will find reason for hope. Can we make that prayer in the next few minutes? I want you to pray. I want you to really pray. <laughs> And I will call upon your name, Kabo Zabaladas, and keep my eyes upon the waves. When the oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am. And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes upon the waves When the oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace I am yours. Kala soba ra kai kon soba la. Shako be braso bo koro kos. Kapo ajes apolos. Kapo kapi abo se preda koma la soba la. Oh yes, and keep my eyes. 